I proclaim I'm marked by 
Turning back won't change my mind. 
As Hurricane Ian approached, you heard the request and maybe even made the request to relatives and friends, we need prayer. Remember that thing was going to go above us <laughs> and then it was going to come right at us and our prayer lives kind of increased a little bit and um, we were making requests for prayer. I even heard some news reporters, uh, you know, on the, on the TV shows, um, local uh, folks, a couple of them, making requests for prayer. I don't know if that's legal anymore, but uh, they're, on, they're online. You can YouTube it. Um, and so when, when we say, please pray, or prayer is needed, what are we talking about? What, what, does that, what does that even mean? We, we, two weeks ago, we asked the question, does prayer work? And then last week, we asked the question, or we looked at uh, hurricanes in general and lessons we can learn from them, um, uh, still following the passages that we have. And then today, I'm back to, does prayer work? Uh, because we're in the book of Colossians, uh, chapter 4, and uh, Paul is requesting prayer. So the last two weeks, we've seen the context of that request. We'll mention it today, and we'll go through, uh, uh, hopefully, all of the requests for prayer that Paul has made while he was in prison, that we have written, anyway, in the Bible. So we'll take a look at it momentarily. But what, what did we mean? What did we want people to do? What did we want people to say to God when we said prayer needed? What, what, do, what do we mean by that? As uh, Hurricane Alley approached Virginia Beach uh, a while back, uh, Pat Robinson, Robertson, a uh, nationally syndicated uh, guy, um, and, and followed by, by thousands and thousands of people, um, he, he made a recording that he and uh, some guys uh, prayed, and the, pray, the uh, hurricane uh, veered at the last minute from hitting um, uh, the beach, Virginia Beach, and uh, his studio, and went south <laughs> and killed people. Yeah. I want us to think today, did prayer work? I am very much a proponent of conversation with God, conversation with the Trinity, as Paul is, okay? He is laying down his heart for prayer in these letters. I am going to try to lay that down as well. At the same time, I want us to think biblically. Too many people are sucked into the immaturity of too many. Not to be outdone, a guy named Frank Logan, you can YouTube this, don't do it right now, how Jesus saved Tampa from Hurricane Ian. And it shows a picture of him standing at the water, white robe, and he is um, uh, praying uh, the, out of, um, um, I think it's Mark chapter 4, and praying that the hurricane would dissipate uh, and be calm. And he is now online taking credit for Tampa Bay being saved. He and others. You can YouTube this stuff. I, 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 I did uh, yesterday. He and others are taking... We, we, hey, it didn't hit us. Now, it killed... I don't know. I don't know what the count is around 100 people south of us. But it didn't hit us. In Acts 27 that we looked at last week and the week before, Paul on that ship and a what would be the equivalent of us of a hurricane. Um, different, but it still was you know, for, for several weeks. We're just pounding them. They lost everything and nearly lost their lives. Where was uh, Frank and Pat? They could have just sailed smoothly to Rome if they would have had those guys. By the way, if I would have taken a video of myself, I was in South Florida with Andrew. I'm just going to tell you how spiritual I am right now. I was in South Florida when Andrew was plotted to come right 
pinpoint our house. We're on Caroline Road. Come right at our house. And we prayed. And it took a two-degree turn to the south and did incredible damage. And I don't know how many lives were lost. We, I was here when Charlie was uh, fixing to come right down the mouth of Tampa Bay, which is basically where our house is and our church building is. And we were praying, and it turned south, and we were spared. And Irma, that daunting hurricane, for the most part missed us. And now, now Ian, at one point, slated to come right at us, and we were praying. And if I would have been on the beach on those four occasions taking a video of myself, I could post that online right now and be a great prophet but truth be told, I wasn't praying that it would veer off of us. I, I, with all of those, I am praying that it would simply dissipate. And, and that, you know, because I don't want destruction and people to die. So back to the question, does prayer work regarding hurricanes? The uh, origin of hurricanes or possibly three things working together. One would be fallen nature, Romans chapter 8, verse uh, uh, 20 and following. Uh, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together unto now. There are natural disasters. Jesus said that would mark this whole entire age. It's, the earth is cracked and things happen and the low pressure and the warm water and the wind and the earth's uh, uh, rotation work together and hurricanes are formed. I think it's not supposed to work quite that way, but because of the fall, that's how it works. And we have hurricanes. Satan in Job chapter uh, 1 verse 19 caused a great wind to happen and uh, a house, a building uh, house fell on Job's ten children and they died. That's the destruction of a house. I don't know if the little fella is, is able to create a hurricane, but he does dabble uh, apparently in weather a little bit. And I'm not blaming the hurricane on, on Satan by any stretch. Um, and then uh, there is God, who in uh, Job chapter 36 and 37 speaks about using these disasters, these, these storms, to get our attention. And indeed, uh, in Egypt, that's what he did. And certainly in Revelation chapter 6 through chapter seven, uh, 18, uh, that's what he is going to be doing. One that will free our, our grip on this planet, on the creation, that we trust the creator, that we focus on the creator. Everything here is shifting. And so God brings that out. Now, the result of these forces, look at the map. Uh, on the front of your uh, bulletin, it's also on the screen. Um, these forces work together to bring about that. And I'm looking at our region of the world, Tampa Bay area, and I'm going, is that a result of prayer? Are we going to be that arrogant? But there, there it is. There's the forces working together. Is God sovereign in those major hurricanes that have uh, hit Florida? That's a map of them since uh, whatever it was a number of years ago. Um, you know, what do we do with that? Does prayer alter the paths of hurricanes? By the way, should we even pray about that? For what should we pray? What should we pray? How should we pray now? For what should we pray right now after this hurricane has already hit? Let me ask you another question. The godly, the Bible-filled, connected with God, spirit-filled godly, through the years, what have they been praying for regarding Florida? Florida. And even regarding the, 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 the region that was hit. What are God's plans right now? What, it, what would it be like to join the Trinity in family conversation? Because that's what prayer is. We don't say prayers. The recordings of prayer in Scripture are, 
outlines of what the folks, Jesus said, when you pray, pray in this fashion. And he gave us an outline. And the, the prayers recorded in scriptures are just, are just sketches of, 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 uh, of what was on the heart between the, uh, whoever was praying and, and, and God. If we were to join the Trinity in conversation right now, how would that conversation go? Is the Trinity highly concerned? The Trinity loves every person, the worst of people. But is their number one concern safety, happiness, living pleasantly? Or is it possible there are, other, there are other deeper concerns with the Trinity. And it's kind of like a family conversation. In a family conversation, you know, you bring the kids in, and it depends on their age. Um, they may not understand a lot of the conversation. And a lot of their requests in the conversation may be very, very immature. And I think that's the body of Christ today. What I want to do today, here's the goal. I want to take us from being immature or wherever we are and get all of us and grow our maturity level so that we can better listen now better enter into the conversation with the trinity regarding how to pray right now you say well how do how are we going to do that we're going to look at the heart of god in the pastoral letters, uh, um, uh, these, these four letters that are, are, are in front of us. And you have uh, the recording uh, of every, um, every um, request, if you will, for prayer uh, in these, um, in these uh, uh, four books. All right. So uh, I, we've already gone through three of them, and we've studied them in detail. I'm simply going to pull out the big ideas and say, this evidently is what the Trinity has laid on the heart of Paul to converse about. And this is what he's asking the believers to converse with the Trinity about, and what I believe he's leaving for us as well. God is sovereign, and in God's sovereign plan, he works through means. God's going to have his way. But he works through means, and he invites us into conversation with him, and he invites us to walk with him, and he invites us to grow and become bigger and bigger boys and girls in understanding what he's up to, and that our conversation becomes with him becomes more and more mature. All right, so let's go ahead and dig in now. Having experienced a hurricane uh, I'm going to use the word hurricane, uh, but a, a, something like a hurricane on the way to Rome as a prisoner. He's a prisoner. This is Paul we're talking about. Uh, his life is in the balance. He could be killed every day. He's lost everything. He's got a leg, leg iron on. And uh, here he is writing. And having gone through what I'm going to call a hurricane and having a leg iron on and facing the possibility of death, Having that kind of wisdom and gone through so many horrific things, read uh, you know Second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter uh, uh, eleven and twelve happened before this. All right, so many horrific things. Having that kind of wisdom, that kind of connection with God at this point, he even saw heaven opened up and saw visions of heaven at one point. Having that kind of connection with God. He's going to make, by the Spirit of God, very wise, mature requests. Let's find out what they are. And the, this will help answer us, how should we pray now? By the way, the Bible does say the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man does accomplish much. And uh, in uh, the illustration used is the illustration of a very human individual uh, praying, and it didn't rain. It's just his atmospheric uh, change. It didn't rain for three and a half years. He prayed again, and it rained. That's, that's, a lot of, uh, that's a lot of atmospheric weather kind of stuff. Why did this individual pray this? Because God told him to. He was praying the will of God. And so it happened that way. Well, why did God tell him to pray? I can't answer all the ins and outs of why sovereign God wants to use us as means to accomplish many things that he does, but he does, 
and let's be honored by that. Everybody good? Okay. All right, so how are we to pray? Again, this is the wisdom of Paul. Having gone through a hurricane, lost everything, uh, again, a leg iron on him. How does he pray and how does he request that these uh, churches, these believers that he's writing to pray? You've done this study. I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> again, go very, very quickly. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 and following is our passage that we've come to chronologically. And uh, he asked them to be devoted to prayer, always be in connection with the Trinity, always be listening for the voice of the Trinity. And keep alert as you're listening for his voice with thanksgiving. Paul, you've lost everything. You're facing death. And with thanksgiving, that, you're going to find that word, <clears throat> just going to give you a, a, a spoiler alert. You'll find that word scattered throughout all of this. Always an attitude of thanksgiving. Next verse, praying at the same time for us. What is your request? Prayer for safety? No, he requests that we can make clear the gospel. There's opportunities to share the gospel, whatever that means. God, we want to share the gospel. And so, God, please make the means possible. That's his personal request. Backing up in the... Uh, letter, we're going to skip uh, the Romans passage because we did that last week in your, um, in your uh, uh, sermon outline. You have Romans first because that's the passage that sets all this up. Uh, notice he mentions, though, uh, in a prominent position, traveling in the will of God and evidently going through a hurricane was the will of God. Uh, makes it to Rome, and now we're going to pick it up in the next passage you have down, which is the beginning of Colossians. We're going to skim Colossians, we're going to skim Philippians, we're going to skim Ephesians, and see what maturity in prayer looks like. So in Colossians, verse 3, uh, again, we give thanks. That's just prominent. You're going to find that throughout. And then the first thing that um, he mentions to them, to them that he's praying regarding I have not ceased to pray for you, this is verse 9, and to ask that you be safe and healthy and happy. I have not ceased to pray and to ask that you, in other words, I'm, pray, I'm, I'm, I'm asking God for this all the time. In my conversation with the Trinity, this is what's always coming out, that you be filled with the knowledge of his will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that you can have an appropriate lifestyle, bearing fruit, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened, not that trials be removed, but strengthened in the midst of those trials. So I'm praying that you know God, that you know His will, so you can have an appropriate walk. That's the first example we have. Have we been praying that for one another before the hurricane hit and for the folks that are survivors in the path of the hurricane. Is that our prayer life, our conversation with the Trinity? And then goes on, and, and notice the book ends, verse 3, giving thanks, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. So all of that is, is encompassed with the, the giving of thanks. I've included the words rejoicing because that's what rejoicing is. It's done before God. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a word of worship. In chapter 2 of Colossians, what do we have here? He's praying that their hearts would be encouraged and that they would have a full understanding of Christ. And he's, verse 1, struggling in prayer that that would happen. I say verse 1 refers to prayer because of uh, verse uh, 12 in chapter 4. The well, same word used there, even though it's translated with two different words. So, Second thing we get is he's praying for their upbuilding and that they would know and understand Christ in the midst of their difficulties. Chapter 3, verse 15 and following, thankfulness, 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 just scattered throughout. And then chapter 4 and verse 12, this other guy, Epaphras, is, is a guy that's with me and he's laboring for you in prayers. He's hurting for you. And in the midst of all that you're going through, this is what he's praying, that you would stand perfect, fully assured in all the will of God. You're going to find that expression over and over, that they would know God, that they would know the will of God. It's interesting how God can use disasters in our lives to kind of get our attention that we get in tune with the will of God as opposed to our fast-paced, hurry-up lives 
where I'll get to God and His will one day when I have time. That's you, that's me. We're running hard and fast. And we have no time. But we'll, but we'll, we'll figure out His will when we get old and we can't do fun stuff anymore. No offense to some of us. So that's how he prays in the book of Colossians. Let's go on to Philippians. We having fun? Book of Philippians. And again, I, again, we've covered these passages, all right? I'm just, I'm just bringing out the big ideas. What's, what's the topic? What's he praying for in the midst of struggles? His struggles, their struggles. All these, all these believers are struggling. All these churches are struggling. Uh, persecutions mounting, all right? Book of Philippians begins the book with, with verse 3. I thank my God. There's that redundancy. Prayer with joy. You're going to see joy. Book of Philippians is joy throughout the book. Every time you see the word joy, that's prayer. That's, that's, a, that's a rejoicing before God. That's what joy is. It's a worshiping God. And this is his first uh, request regarding them. Verse uh, 9. I pray that your love may abound more and more in real knowledge and discernment. Why does he pray for safety? Isn't that the important thing? No, he's praying that their love in the midst of difficulties would abound, would grow. That they would approve the things that are excellent. That they'd be sincere and blameless in the midst of all they're going through. Chapter 1, verse 18, later on, he's rejoicing in, even in his imprisonment. That's what's in context. And he says, I know that your prayers will, uh, will turn out for my deliverance, believing in the sovereignty of God, but God using the means of prayer. And what does he mean by deliverance? Well, down in verse, 29, uh, verse 20, I'm sorry, uh, next verse, I will be delivered either by life or by death. And God's going to use your prayers to bring me through into deliverance either by life or by death. I don't know if, if Caesar's going to cut my head off or not. Any given day. But I know I'll be delivered. And I know God will use your prayers in my life. He's a big believer in prayer. But his request for himself, verse 20, is what? That Christ would be exalted in his circumstances. He didn't, he's a human being. He didn't like his, his circumstances. Going through a hurricane, being incarcerated, facing the death penalty, uh, being seen by everybody as a criminal. But I'm good. If Christ will be exalted in the midst of this storm in my life. That's the attitude. Where, that's maturity. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with, I pray for y'all. I pray for the folks that, that I, I, you know, I, I pray for your happiness, for your pleasure. There's nothing wrong. It just, that can't be the beginning and end of how we pray. All right? Whatever was on our hearts, we bring before the Lord. He's our Father. So I, I pray that you get every, just, I just live in complete happiness. Though that's probably unhealthy. But I'm praying that way. But I, I pray God's will, you know. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with those things. We just got to mature past the temporal, the physical, the, the, the happy things. Philippians uh, chapter 1, again, we have uh, uh, the example of prayer there for their love to grow. And for his, uh, his witness. And then the whole rest of the book is just rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. All the way through. You can see those passages with thanksgiving. And then verse, uh, verse 6. Don't be anxious about everything and everything, for anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That includes, God, please dissipate the hurricane. Please, please don't let this hit us. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. We just have to go beyond that. Let's grow up. Let's be mature and focus the you know, majority of our conversation with the Trinity on the heart of the Trinity. All right? So that's the book of Philippians, book of worship. God, use this for worship, to grow us in worship, to grow us in love for one another, to, to give us the opportunity for witness. Now, book of Ephesians, we've got the three major uh, sections on prayer, one, three, and, uh, and six. And so in, in, in chapter 1, the, the incredible gifts of God are, are listed. And then based on that, um, verse, uh, what is it, 16, I don't cease to give thanks for you, you folks that are, that are in Ephesus. I make mention of you in my prayers that God would do what? Give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I want, in the midst of your trials, I want you to know God. 
That's my, that's my prayer for you. That's, my, that's how I, I talked with the Trinity. I want your heart to be enlightened, verse 18. I want you to know your hope, the riches of your life uh, in Christ, uh, the riches that are, that are uh, going to be yours in your inheritance, His power at work in you. And that's chapter 1. Chapter 3, the next uh, major section on prayer. Uh, I'm praying for you. I'm bowing my knee before the Father, verse 14. I'm praying for you that you would, four things, that you'd be strengthened with power through His Spirit and the inner man. It'd be nicer to not need the strength to live with happiness, and we don't need to be strong, but I pray that you'd be strengthened. I pray that Christ would dwell in your, in your hearts. I pray that you'd comprehend the, love, the deep, deep love of Christ, which you can't know in any other way but going through difficult things. Read the, the end of uh, Romans chapter 8. And all of that, number four, that you would be filled up to all the fullness of God. That's a mature prayer. A mature request with the Trinity. And then the uh, third section on prayer is chapter 6. He mentions a few other things in, in prayer with thanksgiving and being following God's guidance, filled with the Spirit, following God's guidance. But the, the third section is chapter 6, uh, verse 18 and following. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. That, mean, that doesn't mean speaking in tongues. That means listening for the voice of God. We walk in the Spirit. We listen for the voice of God. Be on the alert with perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf. So he's saying walk in prayer. Be listening for the voice of God. Be led by God. I want you to know. That's the same as saying I want you to know God's will. And when you think about me, verse 19... Pray that utterance would be given to me. I want to share the gospel. I want to use this incredible opportunity of my incarceration, having gone through the hurricane, being, being chained. I want to share the gospel clearly. God, pray that God would guide me in using this experience, that God would give me the utterance to open my mouth, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. The mystery is what was referred to in the Old Testament, what's true in the New. For which I am an ambassador in chains. That I might speak it boldly as I ought to speak. That's what he wanted to pray. If Paul was in, if, if Paul was in Fort Myers right now, what would what request? We're getting, we're getting a rhythm here. What would he request for himself? We're getting, a, we're getting a rhythm going. We're, we're seeing it. Okay? This is how we pray for one another all the time. In Philemon, the last book of the four that were written from, as far as we know, that were written from uh, uh, prison in Rome. And, and again, it, it, it seems that he was in Rome, writing from prison, having gone through this hurricane. Uh, that's where most scholars come down. And in the book of Philippians... He says this regarding prayer. I thank my God always making mention of you in my prayers because I hear of your love. I'm flipped out about you loving each other and your faith, which you have through the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And here's the request. I pray, here's, here's what I'm, how I'm praying for you. Here's what I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your safety and happiness. No. I pray that the fellowship of your faith, fellowship, koinonia, the sharing, the doing life together of your trust in Christ may become powerful, effective through the knowledge of every good thing, the knowledge of God's will. Are we seeing a little bit of a pattern here on how mature believers enter into conversation with the Trinity? I hope so. And so, if I could just summarize what we've, been, uh, what we've been reading. Now, again, this is just one slice chronologically of Scripture. There's other things in Scripture, but I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus is teaching on prayer and that the other uh, teachings on prayer in the New Testament thoroughly jive with what we've been reading. But we just don't have time to go there. I wish I had all day with you. You, you know I do wish I had all day. Does prayer work regarding hurricanes? How should we pray? Well, the number one, and I, this is my math, and going through the four letters that were written after Paul went through the hurricane. 
and in a storm of, of, of life in himself at that point. Here's the, the big request. Number one, what is it? The will of God. God and the will of God. Christ and the will of, of Christ. God and the will of God. That's, that's, the, that's the dominant request in my, in my math. I just kind of added them up, going, what's, what's the big request? And that's it. And if that means possibly shutting down our lives for a little bit, the folks come in tune with God, that you would know God and His will, that you would know God and His Christ. Number one, that we pray that for this region of the world as Ian was coming forward. God, that you would use this storm in this way. That's maturity in conversation with the Trinity. Number two, their love for one another and their growth and their edification. Stack it up. My math, number two. Pretty close to the first one, but not as, not as many. You do your own math and let me know how it comes out. And then number three, witness. Their witness, evangelism. And all of that encompassed and surrounded by thankfulness and rejoicing, that's worship, and alertness, asking God to guide them. Let me close this thing down with uh, three notes in case you didn't get them already. How Jesus uses hurricanes. Now, we went through about 16 of them last week. Okay, I'm going to, he's going to do three right now. We're going, we're going to shut this down, okay? How Jesus uses hurricanes, and that gives us a hint of why these are the requests by Paul with the Trinity concerning these friends that were going through a really tough time. All right, number one, how does Jesus use hurricanes to grow us in our love for God and the knowledge of his will? Number one, absolutely number one. Slow us down a little bit, adjust our focus. Wow, do we go after creation as opposed to the creator? We all say we don't. But what, what did your mind dwell on on Saturday, on, Sun, on, 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 on Friday? We're just enamored with creation over the creator. That's me, and that's us. And for God, uh, and that's what he's going to do at the end, right? The, with uh, Revelation, uh, the, the, uh, the, much of Re the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 6 through uh, chapter 18. He's going to do all these things to kind of break our grip on, create, uh, on the creation to say everything is shifting sand here. We want to focus on him. So number one is to grow us in the knowledge of him and his will. He, uh, he, he, he refocuses us, adjusts us. And I think in the midst of that, grows us in this depth of thankfulness, this depth of joy. How much do you take for granted? How much, you know, I took, I, I took a tree in our side yard. We don't have a lot of plant life. I mean, we live like, you know, zero scape kind of stuff. But we had a tree in the side yard that I, I liked, when, on the rare occasion I was at the house, uh, that I liked to park under. I came home after the hurricane. It was on its side. My tree! thing was rotted. I'm kind of glad it went down because if it came down some other time, it wouldn't have been good, you know. thing was just all rotted and, and uh, boom, on its side. I'm like, ah! Oh! I don't know if I ever thank God for that tree. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's how much stuff we take for granted, you know? So, uh, grow, you know, this, this whole thing, again, this is all point number one, our love for God and His will grows us in our depth of thankfulness. That means worship, joy in Him. Uh, we asked the grandkids, um, uh, uh, Karen and I, um, so what, what did, we were at, this is right after the hurricane, so, so what did we learn from the hurricane? One of the first things our grandkids said, thankfulness. They got it. Just really thought about it. They, they nailed it. Okay, something that just, okay. Um, and so, in, 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 in thinking about God, it increases our focus on the coming kingdom. Lord Jesus, let your kingdom come. Everything, this is not the kingdom that we are looking for. Number two, it is growth in love 
for one another and Christ-likeness that Jesus uses hurricanes to accomplish. Growth in love for one another, growth in Christ-likeness. I could make them two points. I'm just going to combine them together in one. As we serve, as we have opportunities, that's the big word, and we seize those opportunities and we serve one another, we will grow in love for one another. We will. Okay? Service produce in the, with the right heart produces love. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 and following. We tend toward separation. You know, go to work, come home, drive into, if you're one of the rare people that doesn't have so much stuff, that you can actually drive into your garage, right? You know what I'm saying? You know, you drive into the garage, go into your house, do whatever you're going to do. Next morning, you come out, get in your car, open the garage door, and drive to work, come home, drive in, park the car. Yeah. We, we, we are so separated in our society overall. It's kind of neat how God uses this stuff to bring us together. Um, and so... Uh, and God uses these things to grow us. Romans eight twenty eight really is true, even for families that have lost a loved one. And I don't make, mean to make light of anything that anybody's going through, uh, especially the death of a loved one. Uh, somewhere around a hundred, I think it is. Um, Romans eight twenty eight still is true. God uses all things together for good to those who love Him, to those who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, these He also did predestine to be conformed into the image. Of his son. What's the great good that God wants to do in your life? Conform you, conform me, conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. And he'll use all things, pleasant things, wonderful things, but painful things as well, grievous things as well. Don't like it that way, but that's the way it is. Part of this growing in Christ likeness, the humility, we mentioned that last week. You're, uh, James chapter 4, you, we, our lives are but a vapor that appear and then they vanish away. Get us on the same page with, uh, with God toward one another. And I mentioned last week as well, this whole, this is a, talking about our love for one another internationally. And that is this little taste of fragileness, little taste of time without uh, water, time without uh, power, and some other losses. A little tiny taste. Give us, just soften our hearts maybe a little bit regarding compassion toward people who don't know what electricity is. Or if they have it, it's very, very sparse. Don't know what running water is. Don't know what sanitary conditions are. Don't know what it is to live in anything besides something that's made out of cardboard. Just softens us a little bit. May he soften us all the more. And that's, so that's growing in, in love for one another here and then globally. The number three, the last one. How does Jesus use hurricanes? Opportunities to live the mission. Uh, we travel all over the place um, after, uh, after hurricanes again. Um, right now, we're taking care of our county, making sure uh, everybody that we learn about and that we, we're actually driving around looking as well, uh, that nobody has a tree, that nobody has a tree left on their house. There's three houses that have trees that are very dicey, that are, it's killing me right now. Somehow, we're going to blow those things off those houses. I haven't figured it out yet. Somehow, uh, we got to make it happen. It's three houses. Uh, but besides that, we don't know of any other houses in the county. So we're trying to, and then we got tons of trees and yards and stuff, trying to get all of that done. Okay, uh, get people, not, not, it's not, again, not that we have to rake up every yard, but the, the, the idea uh, is to get all the, all the difficult stuff done in this county, stuff that's really, uh, you know, adverse to people, and then uh, move our attention to, um, uh, to the, the south uh, in these uh, tougher areas. Um, so we travel all over the place, and I can tell you, uh, as we've gone out, we try to share the gospel with every single person in a way that's, that's um, very appropriate. Um, and uh, we've had some great gospel conversations. But, when we, but that's just Manatee County. When we go to these areas where you have person after person with, with near-death experiences, and they'll talk about it. You can go there two years later, and they'll talk about it like it happened yesterday. We experienced this in uh, uh, New Orleans. That trauma, that whole thing uh, comes back, and there's a receptiveness and an openness to the things of God and to the gospel that in our arrogance, where we're invincible, we don't have. So, you know, again, I'm not thrilled about the plan, but it's true. Um, there's an re increased receptiveness. And I think also at the same time, um, in regard to sharing the gospel, 
uh, God displays the sinfulness of sin. Do you, do you understand why Ian happened? One sin. One sin with Adam. That's why it happened. One sin cracked the entire universe. And so it, it's a display of the sinfulness of sin. We can incorporate that in the gospel. And at the same time, this is the last sub-point, it's a display, you like that three points but with some sub-points? Yeah, a gentleman that you're starting for the, for the ministry. This, that's how this is done, okay? Haven't got to the sub-sub-points yet. Listen, one, one more sub-point. It's a reminder of the coming judgment. Luke chapter 13, verse 1 and following. There was reported to Jesus and his boys a report about Galileans coming in um, um, and, and uh, Pilate's folks had uh, slaughtered them uh, and, and, and killed them. And Jesus said this, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they were killed, slaughtered? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Another report comes in. Do you suppose that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell, evidently there was a, some kind of a, a construction accident and, and a bunch of people got crushed by this tower and killed them, do you suppose that they were worse sinners than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Is that why they got creamed? No, that's not why they got creamed. Here's what you need. Here's the takeaway. Unless you repent, you will perish. What's the point? When that ominous storm was approaching us, that is a little tiny picture of the judgment to come. And it's a thousand times more terrifying. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so God gives us these little tastes to wake us up, focus us on Him, and be very aware that this is all sand. And there's a judgment to come. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for the privilege to speak together for a few minutes today. And we pray that you would guide us as a family to grow in maturity regarding our requests to you, our, what we should expect to hear if we are led by you in prayer, if we're truly spirit-led, how to be on the same page with you, what to expect from your guidance, and how to converse with you uh, on a more mature level. Thank you that we can bring absolutely anything to you, including our personal happiness. But there's some deeper stuff that you want to talk to us about. And that you want to work in us and through us. And so, Father, we pray that you would uh, grow us in maturity. Thank you for the cross. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross. As a matter of fact, friend, if you've never spoken these words to Christ, please, I'm begging you to speak them if, these are, if this is the state of your heart right now. Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross 2,000 years ago. God in humanness dying for me taking every sin I would ever commit, ever have committed, every act of rebellion against your law, in thought, word, and deed, every act on your body on the cross. Thank you for dying for me in my place, paying the penalty of my sin, being punished by God the Father in my place. Thank you for rising again from the dead, showing absolute victory over sin and death. You're alive, you've ascended into heaven, you are present, you are offering me the gift of eternal life right now. Lord Jesus, I trust you as my Savior and Lord, risen Lord. I trust you for the gift of eternal life and for the gift of having you as my King, my Sovereign. I trust you. No turning back, I trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. This area is open for prayer. Anybody that wants prayer regarding anything, if you have a question about anything that was uh, mentioned today, word of balance, whatever, uh, again, this area is open. 
Um, we uh, following this time, I believe we have coffee and donuts, and so hang out for a while. Talk to each other in lieu of no uh, life groups today. God bless each one of you, and God make you a blessing.